Hello, and welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. My name is Diana Alexander, and I am the Director of Private Market Resources with ACEC National here in Washington, D.C. Today, I have brought a very special guest with me, uh, Dr. Walter Kemsies of the Kemsies Group. Uh, Walter is a, a global trade economist and is widely viewed as one of the foremost experts on port, rail, and infrastructure in the United States. His area of expertise includes demand forecasting, maritime and overall global trade regulatory issues, public and private port infrastructure financing, and long-term strategic planning and economic investment. Um, Having worked in major cities all over the world, Walter has a global perspective, which uniquely qualifies him as a global trade economist. Walter has served as global strategist for real estate uh, firm JLL, as well as chief economist for Moffat and Nickel. Preceding his time there, Walter was the head of European strategy at JP Morgan in London and the head of global industry strategy at UBS in Zurich and London. Walter, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the very kind introduction. Absolutely. We're happy to have you. So for those new to ACEC private markets, uh, we met Walter in December of 21 in beautiful and warm Charleston, South Carolina, where we held a private symposium focused on ports, intermodal and logistics markets. Walter was our key speaker and economist who laid out of the state market for us. And so we have invited him back again for an update now that we're nearing spring of 2023. So I'm gonna ask him a few questions for our members and see where things are and where they might be headed in this market. Look at the tea leaves as you will. Uh, So Walter, I understand you're very busy right now and busy and as a consultant in an economic downturn, you're called on even more for your knowledge and expertise and advice to guide us and our engineers. tell us more about the Kemsey's group and what services you provide and the markets you specialize in. Great. Yes. Thanks. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm a consultant to departments of transportation. Uh, just recently finished working on Georgia's uh, plan out to the year 2050. Um, currently working for US DOT on project flow. Uh, flow is a freight logistics operations works. Um, nice acronym for the government's efforts to collect data that is meaningful to, to people who use the ports and the, in, the transportation infrastructure so that uh, they, um, they can predict when supply chain issues are likely to be a problem. Um, it's interesting that, the, that, that this pro- project is in full force right now uh, because a lot of the infrastructure supply chain issues that we were facing have basically gone away. Um, And we can talk about why that is just a little bit. However, uh, we want to be prepared so that doesn't repeat itself. I am consulting with a couple of ports, uh, mostly doing forecasting and in one case trying to help them get their engineers to, uh, when they do a maintenance and repair project, to try to do it in a way that maximizes the ROI for the port. You know, it's, uh, it's, you know, this this concept called asset management uh, is... You know, maybe it means something in it to some engineers, but to the rest of the world, it sounds like you're actually trying to produce a good return on investment on your assets when, in fact, all it is is just a, a maintenance and repair schedule. But you can do these things in a way that prioritizes the, uh, the interests of the port's clients. And if you do that, you're likely to get a higher ROI. And the rest of the work is, is, involves uh, getting industrial real estate built up near the ports. So the, the interesting thing about that is that um, I worked at an engineering firm and then I left, as you mentioned, to go to JLL. And um, the reason I, I left is because the ports had, uh, uh, not New York, not LA, those are big markets. And so you know the big institutions, they're happy to invest their real estate money there because if somebody leaves a building, somebody else is gonna take the position very quickly. What they don't know is that in port cities, this is also true, but we were not getting the institutions to invest in and support uh, industrial real estate projects, distribution centers, warehouses, uh, even manufacturing uh, outside of the the really big hubs. Somebody had to go help them, help guide these uh, mistaken institutions. So um, what I've done in Savannah and Charleston and Mobile is uh, show the uh, investors that these are good gateways and that uh, 
if you invest money there, these ports are going to grow and the industrial real estate uh, is going to be, you know, very occupied. And so what's happened in the last few years is more institutions have allowed uh, smaller geographies, as they put it, to be included in their investment portfolio. And in most of these cities, the uh, especially in port cities in the U.S., the industrial real estate vacancy rates are below 3%. In the case of Savannah, it's uh, at 0.5%. So very, very tight. And, you know, there's 20 million square feet under construction, and there's demand for another 33 million square feet. And this continues, even though container volumes are dropping off and things are getting back to normal. So those are the areas I, I, I spend most of my time in. Great. So I like how you talked about how surrounding port and intermodal work, it's like a mini city. So you also wrap in an in industrial real estate. There is just so much going on in these areas for development that are needed for the design and construction from our engineering firms. So I want to dive a little further into now and look at what the current state of port and intermodal markets look like for our members. How does the supply chain look like and what is it looking like in the near term future? So um, I guess everybody's very aware of the fact that at one point we had uh, dozens of ships, uh, and in one case over 100 ships, sitting outside of the ports waiting to, uh, to get to a berth. Um, the, you know, some of them got reassigned. Some of the ships were asked to go to the East Coast, and, um, and then things got, you know, we had lines forming at those ports as well. Um, and one of the th you know, some of the ports were, 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 people said some of these ports are terrible. Look at all of these, these ships sitting there. But what they didn't understand is that, you know, if you go to a, a city, a new city, and you see a long line of people waiting to get into one restaurant and nobody waiting to get into another one, I would bet that this, the restaurant with a lot of people waiting to get in is a really good restaurant. And so a lot of the ports on the East Coast they had lines because um, you know they were you know, the users of ports were told that these are very good operations, but um, we really went through a a, a very severe uh, surge in, in, in consumer spending on goods, and um, one of the consequences is that some of the biggest importers, um, and you can imagine who they might be, uh, their inventories, which had been growing at a relatively good rate of you know two to four percent per year on average. Uh, when we got to 2020, they surged for the, this is for what the government calls merchandise stores. Uh, their inventory surged from about uh, 80 million, sorry, 80 billion dollars to 110 billion dollars. So that's a big jump. No matter how you measure it, that's a very big jump. And what's happened right now is even though consumer spending continues to hold up pretty well, we just got data that retail sales dropped, but the, the retailers' sales have not been uh, published yet. Uh, but what we're seeing is even though consumers are still buying things, they're just not growing their spending as much. And the companies that increase their, their inventories by almost 50% are now struggling to get rid of them. So what you're seeing is the downstream retailers, the ones who do the discounting, like uh, the TJX company with its three different brands, TJ Maxx, et cetera, they're getting a lot of merchandise that they can, you know, resell in, in their stores. So, so what's happening is uh, the, the uh, inventories at the distribution centers for a lot of the biggest retailers uh, exceed the capacity of the distribution center in some cases by 20%. And uh, the, um, lot of way, the way you operate at over 100% is you put your goods on trailers and you park the trailers in your parking lot. So that part of the supply chain has not been resolved yet. But if you look at the ports, uh, the only issue we have there is a huge number of empty containers. Uh, the containers are sitting there empty because the producers in Asia who would normally get a lot of purchase orders would start asking for those containers to be brought back to Asia so they could fill them up. But the purchase orders from the US retailers is, is down and it continues to decline. Um, it's very possible that at the last minute as we approach uh, the fourth quarter holiday spending season that a lot of these guys are gonna be rushing to refill their, 
their inventories and, and, and have the stores stocked, but you know, we'll see. But right now we're, we're seeing the supply chain very slowly get back to normal. Uh, ports have a lot of empty sitting there, uh, not as many loaded imports, which before were dwelling way too long and uh, gumming up the ports work. So that's gone away. Uh, the truck traffic has declined quite a bit. The drainage rates are down by 10 to 15 percent. So we're, we're basically first half of this year is all about getting back to some kind of normal, whether it's a new normal or like the old normal. Uh, we don't know, but we're definitely getting back to some kind of normal. Uh, so yesterday when you and I spoke, you said the term of post-COVID adjustment, and I thought that was very interesting and, and made sense to me. And, and you also mentioned something about looking at uh, purchase orders, and there was a seven-month delay and what that meant. Um, so can you tell us more about the container volume uh, across the U.S. and what geographic areas are maybe seeing some increases that we should look to for potential more work? Right. So uh, when we last spoke back in 2021, I mentioned that we would have two industry recessions, not a general economic recession, but two industry ones. The first would be consumer goods recession because everybody got stuck at home, whether you know everybody stayed at home all the time or whether they only stayed at home more than they did before, they were still at home. So uh, with the government you know, uh, stimulus, um, the folks, you know, went and bought things that they needed, but and some of them went and bought things that they didn't need it. But the bottom line is, is a lot of stuff was bought. And eventually, as we stopped being at home, we would uh, not spend so much money on all kinds of merchandise. And uh, why the uh, the big retailers got it wrong and, and ordered so much stuff, expecting sales to continue to grow at, at, at the same 20% rate that they did in 2020. I, I don't know what they were thinking. Okay, it's just, uh, you know, it's, just, it's not surprising that they now are, are dismissing staff and cutting back, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but basically, you could see in the TSA data, the Transportation Safety Agency's data on, on people processed at airports, that as, as that number started to rise and people started to travel more, it was pretty clear that nobody wanted to stay at home. So, um, if they're not going to stay at home, they're not going to sit at home. On, they're not going to sit there with their cell phones ordering stuff off of Amazon or Shopify or whatever. They're, they're, they're going to go do stuff. They're not going to buy stuff. And that's what we've seen in the data since the back half of uh, 2021, uh, all the way through till now. And uh, the only reason, by the way, we have any inflation is because as people try to go do stuff, the service sector is still struggling to employ people. So we're seeing now the distribution centers can lay off staff because you don't need as many people to sort out e-commerce orders. But when you go to the flight Delta Airlines, uh, Delta still doesn't have enough people to you know, fly as many flights as they did back in 2019. Uh, I don't know about Disney World, but I would bet that the lines are probably longer than they were in 2019. Um, so that's the shift that we see coming back. Um, and, and so this is what I, I think of as a post-COVID normal. The, the only thing that's different to me is the fact that um, uh, we are going to be working from home more often. You know, the taboo has been broken. Right. So you kind of mentioned earlier about growth in certain areas, um, particularly Savannah and then Houston, we talked about yesterday too. Can you tell us about what's going on in those particular areas or any other ports that are poised for growth? Yeah, the, um, you know, capacity is, a, is an issue. Uh, and, you know, in general, it's an issue. Um, and so when you look at a port, you need to think about a port in terms of, of a gateway. So a gateway, a port gateway is the roadway, the railway, the, the highway, the industrial real estate, uh, labor. These days, labor matters a lot. We'll, we can come back to that in a minute. And then, of course, the port itself. And these six things is what makes up the port gateway. And uh, what we're um, what we're seeing is that in many cities, there are just isn't the ability to increase all of these things at the same time. 
Uh, for example, the city of Seattle, there's very little industrial real estate availability. The vacancy rates are very low, and there's very few places where you could go and, and build new, new distribution centers. So places where you do have ample ability to expand uh, would be Norfolk, Virginia. It would be Charleston, uh, Savannah, Mobile, uh, and Houston. Although Houston is a pretty big place and it's a little congested, but there still is a little bit of elbow room that you can work with there. So these are cities that have expansion capacity uh, for all of the elements of the gateway, and you can expand that capacity in a way that it's balanced. It's balanced across all of these elements. And uh, these cities also have very, very low vacancy rates for their industrial real estate. And uh, the... Uh, the ports are begging the industrial real estate developers to, you know, please give us more product, give us more places so we can grow our volumes. Um, but by the same token, you're also seeing a lot of expansion there, you know, new terminals being built. Uh, Houston is uh, now looking for a site for its third container terminal. Uh, Norfolk continues to expand. Uh, Craney Island is, uh, is you know, a long-term project that is coming to fruition. Um, Charleston just opened the Hugh Leatherman terminal. Savannah is uh, redoing its, its ocean terminal, which is separate from the Garden City one, so that they can handle, I believe, up to 2 million containers a year there. So you can do that. Is it possible to do that kind of expansion in, in, the, in the other larger gateways? Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a lot more difficult. There's so many people living there, you know, in LA, the only way out of all of that congestion is probably uh, building an inland port 30 miles or so from the port and not letting the trucks go to the to the water side anymore. Uh, in New York, I'm not sure what the solution is, but I am working with a company that is developing a solution to be proposed. So we'll, we'll see what happens in New York. But uh, the, the, the problem is, is those areas are just so overcrowded. You know, it's, it's nothing to do with the port itself, just has to do with, you know, the population density. Very interesting. Uh, I wanted to transition a little, no pun intended, to the net zero transition uh, and how that plays into this market. Um, so tell me about, you know, EV, alternative fuel sources and associated infrastructure, what you're seeing. Um, we also talked about the movement from trucks to trains and why that is. So if you could tell our members a little more about that and maybe, you know, by solving one problem, we're creating another. <laughs> I've... Uh... I, I grew up around and in and, and around the, the automobile industry. Um, I, I, I was born here, but I grew up in Brazil. And my grandfather, uh, he was German descent, and uh, he built the very first Volkswagen ever in Brazil. So we've been kind of a car family for a long time. Uh, I've, I've followed Tesla for over 20 years, uh, long before it became a household name. And I thought the electric car idea was great, but now that we're seeing it being deployed, um, there are so many unintended or unexpected things that it's uh, it's a bit shocking. You know, I, I studied when we how we shifted from whale oil to kerosene to light our houses. Um, I, I, I studied historically when we had various different kinds of fuels for cars. In fact, the electric vehicles are not a new thing. They're over a hundred years ago, we did have electric cars, but they were really slow and they took forever to get up to a cruising speed. So the batteries weren't that good. Um, and so here we are today. Um, the batteries still aren't very good. Um, the Federal Highway Administration often issues warnings to park your electric vehicle outside because it might catch fire. Uh, it has to be recalled. So uh, we're still still working on, on getting the, the lithium batteries to, you know, to, to be safe. Um, the problems that we're facing with electric, well, let's just separate, there's cars and there's trucks. With the cars, it's getting a little better. You can, some models actually have over 400 miles of charge if you drive on a completely flat surface. Of course, there is no way you can drive 400 miles in this country in a flat surface. So I doubt any electric car would get the 400 miles that they, they claim you can get. Um, but the problem is uh, it's good for, you know, an electric car is fine for going to work and coming back a little commute, going shopping. But if you take a long distance trip, 
uh, as you go along the interstate, finding places to charge your car can be difficult right now. Uh, the other problem is if you do find a place to charge your car, there's probably somebody else charging their car. Uh, and uh, it takes at least an hour to get enough charge. So you could be sitting there for several hours. So if you're driving from, like my family used to, from Philadelphia to Florida for vacation, um, it might take you a few days as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, two days it might take you more like four or five days to get there. Uh, for trucks, I, you know, I just don't understand how this is going to work. Um, you know, if you're doing some short drayage, I guess it's okay. But uh, for long distance trucking, uh, we just don't have the infrastructure in place for that. And what we're learning is things like for an electric truck, the, uh, uh, the torque is so much stronger with an electric vehicle, electric truck versus an internal combustion engine truck that uh, the tires wear out in 8,000 miles as opposed to 20,000 miles. So uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of side effects here. Um, the hydrogen fuel cells uh, are probably a much better alternative, much easier to deploy that infrastructure and get it established um, than, than having you know, big charging stations for the trucks. So I would expect trucks and, and ships to go in that direction. Uh, Ammonia is a competitive, uh, you know, energy source. The problem with ammonia is, uh, well, there's several of them, and some of the ocean carriers have already ruled out ammonia, saying it's just way too dangerous. But it looks to me like uh, we'll see the trucks eventually just go to hydrogen, and the cars probably, you know, maybe electric, maybe maybe hydrogen. Uh, I, I, you know, it probably would have been a better idea to focus on hydrogen fuel cells to begin with and just leave the electric thing to the side. Very interesting. Thank you for that viewpoint. I think we have time for one more brief question and then I'll get us wrapped up here. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, ask you about inland ports. Um, tell us more about them. Why, why are they popular? Are they still popular? And, and where are they seeing Great from? Great question. Well, there's one reason why inland ports, many reasons, but one of the top ones that, that I always think about is, you know, there's so much truck traffic going in and out of ports. And no matter how many truck lanes you build or what you do, eventually you're going to get congestion. And so being able to send volumes out by train directly from the port, so on dock rail, uh, is terrific. Um, it is, you know, it, it allows the port's volumes to grow without, you know, the congestion killing the port. Um, and, you know, if you set up a, uh, an inland port, meaning when you, you go to some inland location to pick up your container, if it operates exactly like the, the seaport does, so the truck drives in, it gets told where to go, to which stack to go to, to get the box, and where to drop off the empty and then come back out, and it works in some remote location as well as it does at the seaport. It's a, it's, it's a very powerful um, you know, uh, operation that can really attract the cargo. Um, the, um, and, and, if it's, and hopefully it's cost competitive. Um, you know, the railroads do have to make their profits and oftentimes these uh, inland ports you know, have to pay the railroads for the service that have to come in. But once the volumes get big enough, then, then that's not necessary. Uh, the, so cost-wise, it's more effective. Uh, Congestion-wise, it's more effective. Um, and one of the main reasons that we are seeing inland ports uh, becoming very popular is because moving cargo by rail has less of an environmental impact than moving it by truck. So a lot of companies uh, these days, especially the publicly traded ones, uh, the environmental, social, and governance issues that they talk about in their financial reports and they're always trying to report that they've done more to improve the, the ESG score for the company. Uh, using rail is a good way of reducing your environmental impact. And quite frankly, I think right now, the main interest in shifting to, to rail and to use an inland port is really from the ESG side. But logistics wise, um, it, you know, an inland port makes perfect sense. So we're seeing more and more of them. The Port of New York has an inland port up in upstate New York, uh, where Salt Lake City is uh, well connected to both the ports in Oakland and in Southern California. 
Uh, Georgia Port Authority has one in Northwest Georgia. They're building a second one just to the Northeast of Atlanta. Uh, Charleston has two inland ports. Virginia has, uh, who had the first inland port ever. And uh, they're now uh, deciding on where to site a second inland port. Um, I only see inland port business growing. It, it helps the port serve a wider geography with less of an environmental impact. Very valuable information uh, there, Walter. So that is about all the time we have for today. But before we sign off, I did want to mention for our listeners that if you're looking for more information in this market, um, ACEC also just released their private industry brief on ports and intermodal, which is available at acec.org. We will provide a link to that below in the show notes. And you can also subscribe to those briefs, which are released on a quarterly basis. If you would like to get more involved in private markets with ACEC, please reach out to me directly at dalexander at acec.org, and we'll get you set up in our online community in support of this group. Uh, Next month, I'll look to feature the design and construction outlook for the North American market from FMI, including Jay Bowman, who will join us to discuss construction put-in-place numbers, trends, and which markets will fare best and worst in this downturn. Uh, Walter, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me here, Dan. Absolutely. This has been another episode of the Engineering Influence Podcast. My name is Diana Alexander. See you next time.